Come on, Taylor. Okay. Etomic Skinatony. Good morning. It is the dawn of Halloween. October 31st. Tuesday, October 31st, 2023. Come on, Taylor. Um... In the lunar cycle, the almost full moon. I don't know if you can see her up there with this camera. Probably not very good. But, uh, well, she just passed me in a full moon. Um, when the cold arrives. And Taylor and I are just out for a morning hike. We're going to go to Rust Rock Cathedral, I think. Um, we went on a run yesterday. A, about a four kilometer run and a few days before that I went on a, a run with Chris um, who like I think I explained in the previous video has been challenged by her dad hey 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 Taylor never mind hey Taylor just see, seen a dog across the street um anyway yeah, Chris had been challenged by her dad to uh, run the Boston Marathon at some point with him. So that's a big challenge ahead. So we had our first run together a few days back and she did a three kilometer loop. Um, and then I continued on and did a couple more kilometers. And then it felt good. Didn't feel like any strain or anything. I'm worried about my calf muscles. Hey, and my right calf especially. Um, tearing them again and all that kind of thing. Because that's what's laid me up from running for a couple of years almost now, I think. Come on, Taylor. Come on, Taylor. Oh, actually, let's go over here. I should grab a bag in case she does a poop in one of these public areas. Lethbridge has these stations all over the place like this where there are plastic bags for um for picking up dog shit and she's she's already been out this morning so i think she's already taking care of her well, business out in the backyard but the way she's sniffing around i don't know anyhow um, we're out for a walk this morning. I got a couple of topics, like really just, uh, what, what would you call it? Popular culture topics <laughs> to talk about. No particular updates of my own. Oh, yeah, I guess there is one, one update to, to get to of my own too. But yeah, mostly we're just out for our walk, getting in some morning cardio. Uh, since we ran yesterday, today's, today's a walk, as I was saying, um, oh yeah, I think I was explaining about my calf and all of that. I had torn my calf muscle pretty bad, ripped tendons and all that shit. And, uh, the tendon's still not reattached or anything. It retracted behind my calf muscles and, uh, they can't do nothing about it, apparently. Um, <clears throat> but... When I run, I'm very conscious of whether that calf is getting tight or not, because I don't want to rip it. So everything felt good on my run with Chris, and uh, I did 5K. Everything felt, hey, 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 you're all tied up. There we go. Everything felt good. And then uh, about, you know, it was, it was two days later that I ran with Taylor, which was yesterday, and, um, by that morning, my calf was already, like, when I even just walking around the house, I could feel a little tightness in my calf. Now, I didn't, because it was, I was thinking about going running, but I was also, like, half fighting the urge to go running. Um, I didn't know whether that pain, that tightness or whatever might be psychosomatic, but psychosomatic or not, well, it can become fully somatic you know <laughs> I think you can trick your body 
trick your mind can probably trick your body into like having heart attacks and this kind of stuff if it you know if you want to um i had a good friend die of covid uh who myself and and most of his family agree um he psychologically prepared himself to you know he if he got covid he was gonna die and then when he got it you know there you go but he <laughs> he wasn't in that bad a condition that i don't think and most others don't think that you know that it, that it should have taken him out like it did anyway um i didn't want it to become a somatic thing so i i decided well what, 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 what? <laughs> no it's it's my fault sorry taylor right left at that girl you're really bad oh. um should have i'm gonna have to shorten that leash when she goes past people any anyhow um so i when i ran with taylor yesterday i was really being careful my calf uh was was fine for the first maybe two and a half three kilometers and then i just felt slightly like it was getting taxed what oh, fuck hold on she keeps wrapping around my body slightly like it was getting taxed and so um i brought it home at four kilometers whereas you know in my mind i was like well i did five kilometers two days ago I, I should be able to do five kilometers again today but rather than rather than risk that muscle you know I'm gonna make sure it has its rest time and and this uh, you know now even after the four kilometers yesterday um, right now as I walk my calf I can feel it I can feel it it's not a big deal but there is a little something in there. There's a little bit of calf. I would even describe it as a pain. It's a little bit of pain in there. Um, like, not like a muscle torn, but just a little bit too stressed, you know? So I'm gonna let it rest until it doesn't feel like that before I pick, pick up another run. But I'm gonna keep running. Anyhow, um, I'm gonna turn off the camera for a moment, go down the road, and we'll pick it back up down there. So, Taylor and I are now heading down the coulee where the uh, great last Indian battle <laughs> occurred between the Blackfoot and the Cree with the Cree just getting slaughtered in this in this coulee right here where we walk here <clears throat> but um, speaking of slaughters I think just in the past short, brief little period, a couple of days or whatever, since my last video, um, Indian country has been rocked by a revelation that the legendary singer-songwriter, Cree singer-songwriter, Buffy St. Marie, is in fact not native at all as far as uh, genetically um, that she has been all of her life hiding the concealing trying to conceal the reality that that she is a uh, not Biaki just a white girl um, born of white parents, grown up in some suburb, 
outside of Boston, you know. <laughs> um, quite the revelation because many people, um, for many people, Buffy was a uh, entirely a legend and um, a great, well, she was. And she is, and she was, has been a great proponent of um, indigenous causes. And she's written awesome music that has become really the, uh, the soundtrack to many indigenous people's lives at one point or another, you know? Um, for sure, for me, when I hear uh, some of Buffy's music it, it brings me back to a certain time and certain people and relationships and and uh, things that were going on and yeah um, but but yeah it's it seems that the evidence points and I'm still in I'm still in denial about this a little bit because I've seen, I've looked at some of the, the documents and this that are online about it now, and um, some of those documents include photographs of her siblings, um, you know, that are like fairly recent photographs, adult photographs of her siblings, and they don't look native at all, whereas she, to me, definitely does like unless she's like uh going to a tanning salon and having her hair like very carefully uh made to look like what through her eight different ages to you know look like um a native north american woman's hair her teeth her whole facial structure like I don't think she's Michael Jackson. I don't think she can afford to, and she has it like through, like by the time she was, you know, 20 or whatever, she was already representing. And uh, what she's come out and said in response to, you know, the, the attacks on her identity, what she has come out and said is that basically all these years, she has been hiding um, that her 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 biological mother had an affair outside of their marriage, which brought about the birth of Buffy, previously Beverly, by the way. <laughs> I think I think that was her birth name, Beverly, and it wasn't even Saint Marie, but. Um, She's become, and that's, you know, that's whatever, that's showbiz. But, um, but yeah, she's, say, she's saying that her mom had an affair. There was none of her business to, like, be the one who publicly um, reveals that for her mom, you know? And so she's kept it a, a secret. And she's told over the years various versions of who she is she's been from born of different tribes and adopted and this and that you know um so it's her it's her it's her um it's her deceit that really has people bothered i think more than the fact that you know she's she's appears to be non-native as far as the documents go you know um as, as far as genetics go but this is a woman who for sure like she's 80 years old and since she was 20 that has been her identity or whatever um if not earlier i don't know like i can't say <laughs> but <laughs> from what from what the media would have us believe it's yeah it started uh, you know, when she was kind of a folk singer in Greenwich Village. And uh, maybe she had appearances that were indigenous and then 
she got hired to uh, to to represent a native woman for the first time being represented on Sesame Street, and uh, and that this launched her, you know, identity as Buffy Saint Marie the the uh, indigenous woman. I don't know if that is, like, I'm sure that's not her story, right? But that's what the media story is. So, and because of the backup documentation they've been able to provide, you know, including like her original birth certificate and pictures of her as a child and this kind of thing. Um, <laughs> like, a lot of people are sure enough convinced that um, that she's a white girl who 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 uh, well they're upset because it, you know she's she's become famous and made a lot of money off of an identity that's that's fake hey, or, or pretend um, I think it's all an interesting issue considering that culture is one thing that you can actually acquire regardless of genetics and that um, <clears throat> and that uh, like this is an era when we're allowing people to to uh, say that they are whatever um, gender they they'd like <laughs> And there's not just two or four or eight or whatever. It's however many they they think or, you know, could be anything, right? You can identify as anything except, um, you know, of course, another, another ethnic group. Like this is showing, hey? Like another ethnicity. Or it's, it's not an ethnicity. What we're talking about is... What are we talking about? Is it no? Because not ethnicity. Kind of, to me, it, it entails culture, and it's not so much that we're talking about whether or not she's genetically native, and if she's not genetically native, is it okay that she misrepresented herself as genetically native, and and reaped a lot of attention and rewards for that. I would say if that's the case, that's not okay, right? But I'm still not convinced that she's, that, you know, that she's non-native. Although, the, although certainly the documentation shows so, but what if her mom did have an affair? Um, because it's just, it's just her, her phenotype, how she appears, her appearance, her looks, that have, like, really, she's not native? Because she sure does have me convinced, you know? <laughs> yeah, but that's been the big to-do. I don't have a set, I don't think I have a set opinion on it yet, except that I'm not ready to to throw in the chips that, that, like, you know, there's no, there's no DNA test yet. <laughs> Actually hope she doesn't bother, but, I don't know, it's sad at this point, you know, she's an old lady, and she's basically decided to retire, and she retired a legend, and she did awesome work, she definitely brought native issues, um, to the public eye uh, in, in amazing ways. And she wrote awesome songs, you know, um, that are that are part of us. You know, whether even whether you're native or non-native, especially if you're native, because then you know her whole collection one way or another, but if you're uh, <laughs> of a certain of a certain generation you do not necessarily younger people but um 
But uh, even if you're non-native, you know, you know that song, if you're fr from a certain generation, you know that song from Off a Certain Gentleman, that love lifts us up where we belong. Uh, who was it that sang that song? Hey, Joe, Joe Cocker, Jennifer Warren, but it was written by Buffy St. Marie. Um, where the eagles fly on the mountain high and all that jazz, you know? You know that song. <laughs> So her stuff is part of us. I'm not ready to to make her out to be a villain, even if she lied. Um, we have to start understanding the identity crisis and being able to identify that in like in like uh, uh, in in order to in order to fix the problem, right? If we're if all we're gonna do is cancel people you know past tense who've already done amazing work and stuff and uh and and really uh help the community and become part of it in the in the midst of it is that gonna help us fix the problem if there's a problem I mean, there there is a problem, of course. If there's if there's when the when you start looking at the representation misrepresentation for financial gain, but that's assuming that this is what Buffy's motivation is to misrepresent herself for financial gain. She might not have been interested as much in the financial gain as she was in the actual identity because she sure adopted the identity and she's clinging to it and I mean yeah she she made a lot of money in her career but she had to produce the art that was worthy of making that money um, and yeah she sold it as represented as native art basically and that misrepresentation was it was was that misrepresentation if it occurred motivated by the financial gain or was it motivated by Buffy's own identity issues and that she was finding herself in this other identity because I kind of think if she is a liar I mean we know she's a liar but everybody's lied in their life you know this and that but if she's completely misrepresented herself and she's not native at all uh, biologically um, and has always concealed that on purpose as as the media is reporting even going so far as to as to sick lawyers on family members who are trying to out her and this kind of thing. If that's the case, and she is not at all biologically native and has always been representing herself as such and all of this stuff, still have to ask, I think, what was the motive? I mean if we wanna if we wanna understand and do something about it, you know? And um, and then, if the motive was not financial gain, do we like basically treat her as people are treating her, which is like a, a, a identity criminal, you know? Like like many people have just in a couple of days completely rearranged their perspectives on Buffy St. Marie. Others are like, yeah, we knew it all along, you know. Um, <laughs> but uh, for, for a lot of people, it's been a big shocker. Um, and certainly for me, like I'm, I've went on the social media right away as a denier. And one of the, one of the reason, one of the reasons that I figured out what was even happening that I learned about what's happening is because somebody posted about it, um, with some of the, a link to some of the reports with the evidence and that. And then 
uh, and then this other guy, um, he commented, you know, just like Ryan First Diver, because I'm a pretendian, apparently. Um, I'm not. <laughs> like, I've never made any uh, pretend of, of who I am and where I'm from, and what I, you know, have done in my life and all of that stuff, eh? Um, <clears throat> haven't misrepresented myself certainly for financial gain or anything like that. Whoa. <laughs> um, in fact, there are public talks that I've given online, like look up the one that I did at, what was that university? Um, anyway, look up, look up, you know, Ryan uh, Heavyhead probably at that time, um, Maslow. And there, there will be a, a, a talk in there, at least one, probably two, because I know in Montana as well, um, there was a public talk that I did where uh, before the talk on Maslow, uh, we had uh, Narciss and the late Narciss Blood and I were doing, um, we were having some technical difficulties getting the slides working and stuff. So while they were preparing the slides, you know, I, I kind of gave a little biographical about myself to the audience so they'd know where I was coming from. And, uh, you know, I do that whenever I teach a class that's uh, being represented as a, an indigenous class or something like that. I, I go through a whole bio, biographical about myself and shit. Um, so I'm no pretendian. <laughs> I don't, I don't really believe that Buffy is either. Um, but I, I think, you know, it'll either be revealed one way or another, or if not revealed, then she's a pretendian. But what do we do with that? That's the, that's the more important question. Because um, the idea is we want that not to happen, right? That uh, basically the white people colonizers are not going to be able to um, gain from identifying uh, as someone that they're not, or as someone, you know, as affiliated with somebody that they're, you know, they don't really have the relationships they're claiming or whatever, you know? And that shit does happen. Like, when I was at the University of Lethbridge, just up the hill here, <laughs> a uh, half a lifetime ago doing my master's degree, <clears throat> I was working at Red Crow College, and there was, at that time, a lot of money being thrown around. I mean, it always is. A lot of money is always being thrown around post-secondary um, to indigenous uh, pursuits. And there was some funding. It was the, um, oh, it was actually the Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada, which is one of the tri-councils, one of the three big federal councils that control federal dollars for research funding. They came out with uh, what was called the um, what was it? The Aboriginal Research Program. It, it, it was a it was a strategic initiative. It was experimental, and they were trying to get at what is Aboriginal research. Let's see some examples of it. If you if you don't have to affiliate with a university, or if you you know you can you can if you want to, but you don't have to. You can still access research money. You can do projects that are, you know, of interest to the community. Doesn't necessarily have to be of interest to the scientific community because those federal dollars are actually slated for learning opportunities for Canadians. There should be no reason why it all goes to universities, but it does. It all does. Universities, colleges, 
post-secondary institutions. But that's not where all the learning opportunities exist. And so at this time, SHRC, that's the acronym for this uh, council, at this time, SHRC was experimenting both with Aboriginal research and with, and with artist research. And so they were given some funding to artists doing different projects that were not academically affiliated in this, you know, just to see where things would lead. They fund, they, you know, they ran, I think uh, for the average research, I think they ran three, three uh, consecutive runs of it. <clears throat> and each of those you could get funded for up to a three year project. And I was involved actually in, um, as part of the discussion groups leading into that program. So I knew all about that program. And here when I was at the University of Lethbridge, there was a guy in the economics department, a professor, who basically, he met with me, he asked to meet with me because he knew that this Aboriginal research uh, initiative was coming. And he's like, hey, there's funding available. And he's basically like, can you find me an Indian to work with? You know, that kind of stuff. When I was going to school, still going on. And I'm sure it's still going on today. And uh, that's the issue, hey? Like, and even even more the issue, like when you come up with people like, uh, what's her name? Rachel Dolazar. Or, uh, or potentially Buffy. Who become key representatives of a uh, it's not an ethnicity but a, like a racial category is what we're talking about because it's because what people are upset at is is purely genetics not culture because certainly Buffy at this point after 60 years uh, kind of immersion is is pretty culturally uh, indigenous as much as she is white at least and, and I would say more so because it's been her whole identity for three quarters of her life, you know. Um, so that's kind of currently my thoughts on on the situation right now. I don't. I'm not taking a stance, except that uh, except that uh, if she is a pretendian. I do think we need to explore what her motivation is. And we can't explore that with her if we're demonizing her. We might be able to explore her with her maybe if she's safe to, 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 to talk, you know? And we might be able to learn something if she's safe to talk. But currently, she ain't safe to talk. <laughs> so that's one current event <laughs> to talk to the, that has been on my mind. To the right. Kind of feeling warm now that the sun is out. Had to take off the toque. So we have arrived at Rust Rock Cathedral. The giant public art piece created with flotsam and jetsam from what is currently being called the Old Man River. Mokuan Sisahta. Lots of different stuff. Car parts, bike parts, vacuum parts, electric guitars, rocks, logs, springs, 
whatever, you name it. Whatever comes along, I think is what's in here. Seems to be the expression, I don't know. But, giant castles being built. <laughs> old typewriter, I love the old typewriter. It's one of my favorite installations in here. <laughs> if that's what you'd call it. Another vacuum. <clears throat> what do you think, Taylor? Hey, you're wrapped up. Come here. Come here. Come here. Let me get your neck. Whoop. Should we go inside? Let's go inside. We always go inside. I don't know what it is about Rust Rock Cathedral, but that's been one of the places it's been one of the places I come visit I think it's just because it's a walking destination but you know it's always interesting look at this there's like a weed eater in here <laughs> that's new there's always something new too it grows it grows it's got a uh, a lookout you can climb up there I'm not gonna do that today cuz I'm with Taylor But I always got to have a look around because you never know. It is Halloween tonight. So it is possible that this place will be decked out by next week in Halloween stuff. Maybe Taylor and I will take another walk in a week. Find out if that's the case. Some years there's a lot of spooktacular stuff added in here. Sorry, that was so gay. <laughs> oh, look at these like oven ranges and shit. Let's go over here and check out the river. Really is a beautiful morning out here. I'm glad we got out for a walk. I was considering just going back to bed because I didn't get enough sleep really. I got maybe four and a half, five hours of sleep. And, uh, but I woke up you know, just naturally my body woke me up around five o'clock, you know, three hours before the dawn. <laughs> so I got up and I documented my salubrious indulgence from yesterday and um, had a cup of coffee or two, tinked around on Facebook and Snapchat and this and that. Um, anyway, by the time Chris got off her shift at 7 and got home maybe quarter to 8 or whatever, I was uh, really thinking maybe it's time to go back to bed. It's hesitating. I'm glad we decided to take the walk. I want to talk about that next bit of popular culture. This is kind of a weird, I want to point this out though. This weird depression here, I'm sure... It's part of an oxbow, yeah, for sure. It's part of an oxbow that's kind of had a levee built a across it um, from floods and stuff. That's what, for sure, this this little wetland pond must be with all the cattails growing in it down there. I love cattails, like in the morning, the magic morning sun when you get them at the right angle and stuff. Um, anyway. The next bit of popular culture, come on, Taylor, that I want to talk about. Oh, yeah, this depression. Why is it all these Russian olives <coughs> growing in there? They could grow up here just as well, I think, but they're growing down there. Maybe they do prefer that moisture. I don't know. I had a beautiful Russian olive in the back of the duplex I was living at on the north side, you know, before I moved back home. Anyway, popular culture. As an anthropologist, of course, I am taught that these issues, like that, certainly like that of Buffy St. Marie, um, but also like the next issue I'm going to talk about, these issues that come up that are a public spectacle and debate are really important um, rituals for 
changing, adapting our culture over time, you know? Um, this is part of, the proce- part of the process of how cultures adapt and change is you, is you bring out something that's debatable among different sec- sectors of the culture and, and you go through a big public debate and it's usually around, well, at least in this culture. It's not usually, if you look across human cultures, um, this culture is different in its way of having celebrity and such um, through which the, these popular debates occur. But like say, you know, at Ghana, Blood Tribe, one place, well, these, these kind of popular debates occur even like at Pow Wow, for instance. You know, there's always, there's always debate about different things in Pow Wow, what's being done right, what's being done wrong, in ceremony for sure, but um, when we're talking about popular culture that everybody can get involved in and stuff and have an opinion, even though they do in ceremony too, they certainly do and have the right to in, uh, in a more social kind of thing like that. You know, so, um, but it's not around famous individuals. Hey, it's the Western culture that put, like, they've got the, they've got the, uh, the celebrity thing. And one place where I saw that really clearly was, uh, at one time, me and the late Narciss Blood, again, uh, we were invited to go to Montreal that was a funny story in itself, but we were invited to go to Montreal uh, for a, a couple of day workshop on global warming with Al Gore, David Suzuki, many other like famous climate climate scientists and stuff. But it was it was really Al Gore's show, okay? Um, and there was a huge difference between. The way Al Gore uh, was compared to David Suzuki, and you know the way that Al Gore, you know, was treated in that celebrity status. Uh, well, you know, he was a vice president at the time, or 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 an ex vice president, so he had like super secret service and all of this shit. But they would bring him into the room where we were training five minutes before we'd go in there and they'd usher him out five minutes before we left Um, and this in comparison with David Suzuki who would just come and go with the rest of us very famous David Suzuki but you know he'd just come and go with the rest of us and he'd take his you know lunch breaks in the same foyers we would take our lunch breaks and if you went up to David Suzuki with any kind of uh, your celebrity vibe he fucking he was an asshole (laughs) a complete asshole um to anybody who who gave him that vibe and he gave me if he gave me a blow-off vibe too because i didn't have anything interesting to say to him I, i introduced myself and stuff i didn't have anything really to say to him i just wanted to meet him and that's bullshit, right? So he, he fucking, he was like, whatever, you know? And <laughs> went on, I'm gonna have lunch now, you know? Went on his way. Like, like, it, uh, it was a totally different vibe. But you see that, especially American culture, but it's become like, it's the globalizing culture that has uh, celebrities at the, you know, and politicians can be anybody can be a celebrity it's just whether you're very famous or not right so but you could be from any profession or whatever you know um and and you can be and you can get yourself enthralled in these public debates like Buffy she's the center of public debate around her very identity and stuff and she may you know maybe this is her uh what do you call it? Karma <laughs> for misrepresentation, 
Or maybe she's fucking just being brutalized, you know, because of uh, what's popular and uh, popular opinion at the moment and stuff, which is the changing culture. You know, the popular opinion and the, and the people change with it. If you don't change with it, you know, that's when you become that that guy <laughs> who's hates everything about today, you know, the present and all that kind of stuff. I don't want to become that guy. I, I want to I want to stay current. The older I grow, I want to listen to current music. I want to know the current topics. I want to be open to learning and um, and understanding more and growing as I you know keep growing. Don't get all set in my ways. That's part of the whole problem. I, all that like depressing stuff that I've been going through and all of that grieving and all of that that's all because of attachments you know and uh, not that attachments are bad they're not bad at all you like I would celebrate attachment I think Western culture has the or the globalizing culture is too carefree in uh, in the in the way that they have disconnect like just completely embedded all over the culture disconnect from relationships and and uh, not just dis the disruptions in relationships as the normalized thing um, anyway that's a different topic <laughs> but yeah the whole let's go back to the pop culture and uh, the other topic that I want to talk about the pop culture topic is the Francis Ngannou versus Tyson Fury fight that occurred Saturday night. And I watched the fight. Now, my familiarity with boxing, of course, like anybody else, I grew up watching, you know, whatever was the big popular boxing matches of the time. You know, when I was a kid, it was like Sugar Ray Leonard, Muhammad Ali, you know. <laughs> these guys, then Mike Tyson, you know, Lennox Lewis, I remember, fucking, there was a bunch of guys in there, those heavyweights in that kind of, just in that era before Tyson, and then just when, when he was at his prime, those guys were going out, those guys were fucking, they were awesome to watch, and then, then I kind of like, I didn't pay much attention to what was going on in boxing, you know. Eventually, I paid attention to Floyd Mayweather. I paid attention to Manny Pacquiao, you know. Totally different weight classes and stuff. Um, so, I'm not really into boxing. Not the way that I am martial arts. I, I am a, a judge of mixed martial arts. Professional mixed martial arts. I'm not a judge of boxing. But if I was judging the uh, Nganu versus Fury fight on the basis of how I judge a martial arts fight, I would say that Francis Nganu won that fight. And that he just got ripped off. They gave it to Tyson Fury so he could save face, so they could keep their, their hero and their moneymaker because it wasn't a title fight. He's got other shit coming up. Um, they didn't necessarily want to wreck all that stuff. But it's kind of wrecking stuff. I mean, it's not like no fights are being canceled or anything at this point. But it's, it's, not, um, it's not a rare opinion uh, that, that, that is shared with mine that, uh, that says that Tyson Fury lost that fight, and the, the real embarrassing thing about it is that Francis Ngannou had never been in a professional boxing match before, ever. So his very first fight is to fight the, you know, the heavyweight champion of the world. <laughs> the unbeatable heavyweight champion of the world. And uh, he definitely inflicted the more damage on the champ, knocked him down, 
um, yeah, by, by MMA standards, I would have probably, I think, I didn't go round per round, but I didn't sit there like a, with a judge's eye round per round. But fight-wise, overall, if I was judging MMA style versus, well, I don't even know what boxing style is. I guess they go by, they're really looking at how many strikes, yeah, uh, effective strikes make it through and stuff, but how many are thrown, how many make it through, whatever. I don't know. I don't know how they judge. I can't talk for it. But in MMA, uh, we're looking for who does the most damage. You know, that's the very first thing. That's the main thing, the main criteria, really, is, uh, you know, all of this stuff is taking place in that ring for three to five minutes or whatever in that octagon, in that cage. And, uh, but who's delivering at the end of the round? Who's the, who's been beat up the worst, you know, that like for real. And, uh, definitely in this fight, Tyson Fury got beat up, not Francis Ngannou. So that's my opinion on that fight. Um, there's not a, a whole lot to say about it other than it is another, like I say, another popular culture debate. And this is how cultures change because there are people, there are, there are like big name people, again, celebrities like Chael Sonnen, you know, um, on his podcast or on his YouTube channel saying uh, boxing is, has been proven to be fake. How can a, a guy, 39 years old, I think he is, or something like that, Francis Ngannou, he's not a young buck. <laughs> How can a guy like this come into a boxing ring for the very first time in his life and, uh, and beat, really, the heavyweight champion of the world? You know, it, it shouldn't be able to be done in other sports. There, that's it, that's not a possibility. <laughs> but it is, you know, a guy can always come in and or should be able to come in, like the Rocky Balboa thing. I think this is going to be, per, per chance, a real life Rocky Balboa story, because certainly the first fight was. Nobody expected him to go the distance. Inganu, nonetheless, almost win the fight. I mean, it's a split decision. He lost by one point. In one round. You know? Um, could have so easily won the fight. But the I think, and many people think, that he didn't just because boxing... Because it was... They didn't want him to win. <laughs> the promoters and everybody else, they didn't want him to win. Um, they Everybody expected him to lose. And so they made him lose even though he quite clearly, clearly, clearly won the fight um, yeah so again it's one of these spectacles and there are heavy hitters weighing in now that are it makes boxing look bad that a guy from MMA with zero professional boxing experience can step into there I mean, for sure, if a boxer steps into the MMA cage, which has not happened yet, we're still waiting for one of these guys who has challenged MMA fighters in their venue to come over to the MMA venue. It's not gonna. It's not gonna happen. I don't think. Or if it does, it just could get. We'll, we'll see. Maybe the Paul brothers, some way, this will this will happen. But if uh, Tyson Fury had stepped in with uh, Francis Ngannou into an octagon. Tyson Fury would have been destroyed. And Francis Ngannou almost beat him in his own sport that he is the number one best at. So it's it's a it's a it's a big smear on the reputation of boxing at this point. And it's gonna be uh, one of the biggest talked about fight. It might be one of the most important fights. For sure of the year, it is the most, it's going to be probably the most important unless they fight again this year. <laughs> but, uh, but it might be one of the most important fights, like, 
that's ever happened, you know. And uh, we might see a new heavyweight champion in boxing, a world heavyweight champion eventually emerge in Francis Ngannou. You know? So, but yeah, all of these kind of things. A lot of times I don't get myself caught up in popular culture. But when it comes to the, the fight world and, you know, in current issues in indigenous, in the native country, you know, especially like what just happened with Buffy, it blows everybody. Like everybody's like, what the heck? What, what do I think about this? You know, some just know right away. They have their opinion set. I, I want to try to learn from this thing, but that's the way it always is, eh? This is this is the ritual. Anyhow, we're about to go up the. Uh, well, actually, even it's such a nice morning, and it's a little bit late in the morning. There might be bikes going up the the uh, the muff, and I might be able to dodge a bike quickly enough, but not with Taylor. So we're gonna take the non-bike path up beside the muff, or maybe we'll take the stairs. Let's go take the stairs, Taylor. Yeah, we'll go take the stairs further up and just walk around the coolie edge on the rim to go back toward home. What a nice day. Yeah, Taylor decided we were gonna take the no stairs route, which is fine. I did see a couple of bikes shoot down the, the muff next to us, so it was the right decision not to go up the muff today. One of these days, I want to install a sign right here at the beginning of that, of that muff run that tells bikers to yell out when they're going to come down, you know, because if you yell from here, you could hear it to the river, coming down or whatever, you know, and then anybody who might be in the muff, um, they get out of the way. I see I put it I put a uh, trail cam in there at one time and I seen what goes on there it's not just bicyclers it's families that come walking up through there you know there's some older people sometimes you see them come walking up through there people go all kind of people go up and down the muff not just bikers but the bikers just haul ass coming down with no warning and uh, if they're not tuned in and you're not tuned in, whew, it could be a bad disaster. Could be anyway, even if you are. It's that kind of space. <laughs> Anyhow, we're going to be home very quickly, so I think this will be the end of this video. <laughs> Said what I need to say. Oh, except I did have kind of an afterthought after talking about the fight. You know, given my anthropological background, um, to note that not only is it a ritual of uh, of popular culture, you know, this this particular debate around what just happened, but sport in itself is its own kind of you know ritual event um, in which. We are defining and redefining and changing and growing and vis-a-vis uh, -vis one another or other teams or that kind of thing. There's always, there's got to be a reason. And that's why the fights are so great because a fight is a fight. It's just like all the other sports are like in some way mocking fight because they got the, the competition part but not the right not the actual right down battle part. And uh, fighting gets right to the point. It's a contest. Who lives, who dies. And, um, and let's, let's try different things, right? Let's throw a guy like this in with a guy like that and see what happens. That's what fighting's all about, you know? And it's this. That's what all sports are kind of about, 
except they've gotten more dull than fighting. <laughs> Anyhow, um, I'm going to close with that, and that's my say on things such as whether or not boxing is fake and whether or not Buffy is fake. <laughs>